this is week three of AA Illustrates. This week we're going to be doing a live bot build in A2019. So let's get started. What is AA Illustrates? AA Illustrates is a live interactive social session. And so those who are interested in robotics process automation, Automation Anywhere, can come ask questions, learn, learn about different products, learn about different ways to use those products. Um, we have plenty of ideas for content, but we also want to make sure that this is well tuned for our audience. So if there's specific content or specific ideas or things that you guys want us to touch on, make sure you leave that in the comments. Let us know how we can best tailor this content uh, for you. That's who it's supposed to benefit. So make sure that if there's things you're trying to learn, things you're getting stuck with, things you want to know more about, uh, let us know how we can present that content for you and we'll be glad to, uh, to come up with a way to do that. So please make sure to engage with the community as we put this content live. Who does this guy think he is? My name is Micah Smith. I am a developer evangelist here at Automation Anywhere. Uh, I am a former COE lead at a financial services uh, company and I am an RPA and document imaging enthusiast. So I love everything about RPA. I'm creating bots even on my off time because I just think it's fun. Um, so I have created a bunch of bots as you can see over here, uh, over here uh, that uh, just fun videos of different bots. I've also created bots for the bot store. I've also write a lot. So there's articles of mine on the Automation Anywhere blog about how to run a COE, um, different best practices when you're creating your bots, as well as how you can use things like Bot Store to turbocharge your automations. And so definitely check that content out as well. This week, we're going to be looking at building a bot in A2019. We're going to talk about some different considerations when starting, some different approaches to the same problem, as well as doing some basic testing. And so we're going to get into looking at how to develop a bot. We'll look at how we can take one use case and break that up into different opportunities or ways that we could solve that same problem. Uh, we'll try to get in some Q&A as well if we have time. Um, I'm hoping this one doesn't go insanely long, but so far all of my videos have gone super long. So uh, I'll try to get some live Q&A in there as well. Page login exercise. So this is what we're going to be automating on today. And this is an exercise page uh, from Automation Anywhere. And it allows you to uh, fill in an email address, fill in a password, hit sign in, and then it'll give you feedback on how long it took you and then also uh, your accuracy. And so we're gonna use this to kind of gamify what we're gonna build today. And it's gonna give us some feedback to make sure that our bot is doing what we expect it to and to know how fast it's doing so. So pseudocode. Um, if you're not familiar with this term, pseudocode is human readable steps that uh, our code or our bot will need to accomplish. And so uh, I always like to start with pseudocode, even from a mental degree, just to, you know, when I'm solving a new problem, when I'm building a new automation, I start with pseudocode and it helps me to list out exactly what my bot needs to do in what order. And then it also helps me as I'm finishing the bot to kind of have a checklist to go against to make sure that I accomplished each of the goals that I said I was going to set out to do, right? So... The first step is our bot needs to launch the website. And so we'll have to have the website open, obviously, for us to be able to fill in a username or fill in a password or anything like that. So our bot needs to be able to launch that website on its own. Next, the bot needs to enter an email address. And so as we saw from that screenshot on the last page, um, the email address is a required field for any normal login. And so the bot's gonna have to be able to fill that in for us automatically. Next, we're going to enter a password. The password will be needed for the login to authenticate properly. So we'll need to make sure that the bot can fill in the password on our behalf. Finally, we need to click the sign in button. And that's what really initiates that authentication. And for the page, it's going to initiate the page scoring us. So the bot's going to have to be able to click that sign in button. And we want to think about a bot just like a human interacting with that page, right? If I gave you guys that URL and said, hey, go check this out, you're going to go to that website. You're going to fill in whatever username I gave you, right? You're just going to type it. You're going to do the same thing to click down into the password field. You're going to type that in, and then you're going to go and click the sign in button, right? We want the bot to be able to do that exact same thing. So that's a really helpful perspective as we're thinking about building bots and what the bot should do. Think about what we would tell a human to do, right? It's the exact same thing. We just have to figure out a way to translate those instructions that we would give to a human 
into actual commands that we would give the bot so the bot can replicate those steps. All right, so I didn't update the title on this one, but um, this is the username and password that we're gonna use. The URL for the uh, exercise page that we're gonna be using is in the description of this video, so check that out. Uh, I'll show it on here as well, so you can type it in if you really want to, but um, the, the URL is in the description. This is the um, username and password we'll be using, so uh, it is case sensitive. It's user at underscore, or I'm sorry, user at automationanywhere.com, and then the password is capital A automation one, two, three. I'll repeat that as I'm, you know, filling them in for the bot to, to go through as well, but just wanted to call that out. All right, so let me close out of that and switch to my machine over here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my um, control room and I'll be using community edition for this, which is the same free version that's available to everyone. So if you have not registered for community edition already, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, it's, a, it's a free version for A2019 that allows you to pretty much have the same development experience you would have on the enterprise version. So I'm gonna hit log in here. Um, my password and username were already saved, but um, this is the homepage for the um, A2019 community edition. We can create a bot, we can get into bot insights, we can look at IQ bot, um, but we're gonna start with create a bot. The other thing I'll mention is as a prerequisite to uh, following along with me on this video, I'd strongly suggest going to Automation Anywhere University. They have a build your first bot um, course on A2019. Definitely check that one out. It walks you through the steps of setting up your bot agent, which is basically just associating your local machine with the control room. And so uh, you can see in the top right corner here that I've got my machine logo with a green check mark. Uh, that means that my bot agent has been installed and a connection has been established. But make sure you go through that course. It'll help you to get that part set up. They do a great job of walking through that. So I'm going to hit create bot here. And I'll give my bot a name. So I'm just going to call this login lab. Um, the description is optional. You can give it, if you're going to have lots of bots that are named really similarly, um, definitely give a description. When you start to think about enterprise development and start to think about best practices for reusability, a description is definitely a mandatory thing. It's not optional in that case, but uh, we'll just say first lab to learn um, automating a login. It's going to go into the bots directory by default. That's fine with me, and I'll hit create and edit. All right, so we have uh, an empty um, creator environment here. What we see along the left-hand side is our actions. And so each of these is a package that has one or more actions inside of it. And that will allow us to you know, interact with stuff on a browser. That will allow us to run Python. Uh, here's one for <coughs> folder. We could take different folder uh, and file operations. So lots of different command packages. Uh, what I really like about A2019 is that as uh, new packages become available or packages have been updated to uh, expand their functionality, those packages can be loaded uh, independent of doing a full platform upgrade. So I think that's a really cool approach to being able to handle upgrading a system or enhancing a system. We'll also start to see eventually that Bot Store will allow for packages to be uh, listed and installed directly from there. And I think that's going to really expand what you can do with A2019. But for right now, just know that all of our packages are on the left-hand side, and that's where we find all of our actions. So as we start to interact with different objects on a page or interact with files and folders or, uh, you know, obviously different uh, cognitive services or things like that, those will be available here. Down below that, we have triggers. If you want to set up a trigger to invoke your bot, you could do that. That might mean um, monitoring a file or a folder. That might mean uh, having a different uh, interface monitored for, hey, when I click this button, I want the bot to take over and start to do something. We also have variables, and so you can create variables here. Variables uh, are basically used to store different pieces of data, and so there's some new variable types that have been introduced with A2019. Um, but you can come and create variables here, uh, especially when you're thinking about system variables that might be important for um, 
environments, right? If I have a test environment versus a dev environment versus a prod environment, I might have different variables to represent those different environments. And I might be using different file paths for those different environments. And so that's a good example of when I might want to use variables. In the middle section here, uh, I can change my view around. So by default, it's set on flow view, but I could change that to list view or dual view. I personally like dual view um, just because it gives me the best of both worlds. I would say that list view is pretty similar to what was uh, set up in version 11, where it's kind of like just kind of listing out all the specific commands and the order that you're going to use them. Um, I like to have both up. I'm pretty visual drag and drop kind of person. So having this flow view is helpful for me as well. All right. So the first thing we said that our bot needs to do is to launch the application. And so what I'm going to do is on the action section here, I'm going to open up the application package and drag over the open program file command. Okay. So with the open program file command, it's going to allow me to launch an application that I have locally installed. So I'm going to hit browse here. And this is where it's actually going to connect to my local machine and allow me to browse out and show it the path of where I want it to uh, find the executable that I need to launch. So it's going to do some pre-processing and that's where the bot agent that I have installed locally is communicating with the control room. And there it brought up a browser window. So I'm going to go to my C drive. And in Program Files x86, um, Google, and then Chrome, and then Application, and Chrome.exe, and I'll hit Open. Cool. So you can see that it basically just put that file path in there. You could have done that on your own if you just wanted to copy the file path locally and type that in there. That would be fair game as well, but I wanted to show that that browse was uh, an available option. The other thing we're going to provide is a parameter and the parameter in this case for this particular application will be the page that we wanted to navigate to by default. So uh, I happen to have that URL right here. Um, I'll just open it in a new window real quick. I'm just going to copy that URL. So this is the URL for our exercise page that we'll be using. It's automationanywhere.com slash automationanywherelabs slash login.html. Okay. It's in the description for this video, so you can grab it from there, or obviously it's on my screen right now, so you can see it there. I'm gonna copy that, and then I'm gonna close this window, because I really don't need the window open for this part, but I'm gonna put it right in here. Okay, so I'm gonna hit apply, and that will uh, apply those changes that we just made to the application open program file command, and then I'm gonna hit save at the top right. Now, when I'm doing my bot development, I like to do a lot of testing as I'm going through, right? It's kind of test driven development. And so I'll hit run here because I want to see my bot can actually work. And so what's going to happen is the control room is going to deploy that bot locally to my machine and it's going to actually run this bot. And I should see that Google Chrome opens and that it automatically navigates to that exercise page that we just had that I just showed a second ago, but that that's the URL that we talked about. Um, so right now, the bot agent is downloading some dependencies that I must have out of sync with what's on the control room server, and then it's going to deploy that bot. So there it is. The run app command is going. I can see that it has launched Google Chrome, and there is that exercise page, right? So, so far, my bot is good, but um, when I'm going through and doing my bot development, I like to do that, t uh, that testing, you know, pretty frequently, to be honest. I'm going to go through and do that testing um, every couple commands. You know, I'll, I'll usually like run from a specific step if it's a really long one, but uh, I like to do that testing frequently just so that I'm not continuing to build on something that's not actually working. So if you saw what I did there, I just moved this tab off into its own window. We're going to do that so that when we start to do some of these next commands that it's a lot easier for us to work with. So let me switch back over to my control room now. We got a your bot ran successfully check mark, so that's awesome. I'll hit close here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we want to find the action that will allow us to have our bot interface with that Google Chrome application. So we're going to use the recorder for that. So I'm going to click on recorder, and there is a capture command. So I'm going to drag that over right here underneath of the open program file command. And in the recorder, 
this is where I can have the bot actually interact with something on the open application or the open window. So I'm switch over to the window here because we don't have a variable set up for that window yet. And I'm going to hit the refresh windows button. And when I hit refresh windows, what's happening is it's going to connect to my machine and it's going to try to pull to see all the windows that I currently have open. Now, in my desktop right now, I've only got two windows open, honestly. It's, it's the control room and it's the Automation Anywhere Labs. So it's going to read what windows I have open and then it's going to build a drop down list for me to select what window I want to interface with. So there, it refresh my windows. I will click this drop down and select Automation Anywhere Labs, which was that exercise page we're talking about. Here we can see it has the program, uh, or I'm sorry, the window title as well as the executable. Now, for me to start to interact with that other application, in this case, the other web page, I just need to click the Capture Object button. If you have done this in version 11, you know that object cloning was a little bit of a weird thing where you had to like click and hold and like you can't let go until you're ready to let go on the specific object. That's not the way in A2019. So what you need to do is just click, right? Just like a regular button click and it's gonna automatically switch over to the other, other application. Now, we'll see as I move my cursor around that it's starting to draw a red box around stuff, right? What that's doing is that is the Automation Anywhere extension being able to identify different objects on the page that I'm highlighting for me to interact with, right? It doesn't know that I want to automatically click on the email address field. It's just trying to say, yep, I can see what you're talking about as I mouse over stuff. Right? So I'm going to leave it on this email address field and then I'm going to click, left click one more time. Now, it had the email address you know, field outlined in red when I click that. And so that's me telling Automation Anywhere, this is the particular object that I want to interact with on this page. If you saw a little window pop up there, it did some capturing of exactly what I was talking about. So if I click on this preview here, I'll see a field come up or a window that shows exactly what, you know, what it saw when I did that capture. So it saw, you know, this was the page, this is the actual email address uh, field and outlined in red here is what was highlighted. So I'll hit close. So that's helpful as you're going through and maybe, you know, my bot screwed up on a specific uh, command. I can go and find that command. I can see in the preview exactly, you know, what it was supposed to be interacting with. When I scroll down here, I can see all of the object properties that Automation Anywhere knows about that particular object on the page. So I see that it's an input field. I see that it has an ID of input email. I see its HTML ID matches that. I see the full DOMX path, which in this case is just input with an ID of input email. I can see that it, uh, HTML has frame is false and that the email or that the HTML type is email. And that's just coming from Bootstrap, I believe. And then this is the uh, kind of Automation Anywhere native technology path to be able to find that particular object on the page. So this is basically a list of everything that Automation Anywhere knows about that particular object that I just told it about. And if you see there's specific boxes here that are checked, and those boxes indicate that this is a particular um, property that will be considered when trying to find that object on the page when the bot is running on its own. Down at the bottom here, we've got the action drop down. So we see specific actions that are tied to the particular object that I interacted with, right? Because this is an input field, we have the ability to do things like append text or set text or click. So I'm going to hit the set text as my action. Now, this is where we can either pull from the credential vault, right? If I had stored the username and password in the credential vault, which would really be the best practice, I could pull those from here now. Otherwise, I could select a variable. If I had stored the username or password in a variable, I could pull it from there. Or I could just hard type it. For the purposes of this lab, we're just going to be hard typing stuff. Uh, if you wanted to explore doing that in the credential vault, that would be the best way to do it, I think. Um, otherwise, you could try to do it in a variable and play with that as well. So let's just type in user at automationanywhere.com and we'll hit apply. Let's make sure I spelled that right. Yeah. 
Okay, so I hit apply. Now we can see that our bot has two commands. We're gonna keep going and we're gonna build in the next command here. So I'm gonna click and drag a capture. And as you see, as I drag this over, right, it's highlighting on both the, the list view and the flow view exactly where I can put this thing, right? And it's kind of got that dotted line showing me where exactly it can go. So it has to go inside the start and the end, but then it could go before my first one, after my first one, or below my second one. So I'm gonna drop it right here below my second one. And you'll see whether I drop it on the list view on, the, on the, uh, this side or the uh, flow view, it's, it all means the same thing. It's just two different ways of viewing the exact same content. So we've got our new um, capture command. I'm gonna switch back to window again. Now I'm not gonna click this refresh windows again because really it's the same windows up that I had last time and this drop down is already populated. So I'm gonna hit that Automation Anywhere Labs, Google Chrome. I'm gonna again click capture object. And this time I wanna highlight over the password field. So I'm gonna highlight that and click right in there. Great, so it recorded that. Let's switch back here. So again, just like we saw last time, there's an image preview. I also have all of the object properties that it knows about that particular object. And again, if I wanted to customize these or turn some of them on or off, I could do that. DomX path is definitely not one you wanna turn off though um, in this case, because this is gonna help us to uniquely identify that object on the page. Notice here that my DomX path is not long, right? And that's because there is an HTML ID on the particular input field that we're looking at. And we'll see in a second what happens when we work with our button, but this is a very short path. And, and the good thing about this is because it has an HTML uh, ID on it, even if this page got updated or things got moved around, most likely we're still gonna be okay on this particular uh, recording or capture step because we have an ID on that particular object. If our DOMX path was like all the way from the root of HTML and all the way into like, oh, is this second div, and then the first div, and it was the second input field, and it didn't have an ID at all, then we're gonna be, you know, we're at a higher risk for stuff possibly screwing up as that application changes. So I point that out not to cause any alarm, mainly just to say, this is something that's important to pay attention to. And as you're working with different applications, especially applications that you can have influence on, right? Maybe it's an internally developed app. It's a good practice to tell those people, hey, if you can put object IDs on stuff that my bot's using, it's gonna make my bot much more resilient to changes that your application might have. Enough of that tangent. Uh, back onto the action dropdown. We're gonna select the set text as our action. Now here, again, this is probably where we'd wanna pull something from the credential vault to enter a password. Because this is just like a really intro lab uh, that we're gonna play with, I'm just gonna type it in. Um, but normally you'd wanna do this from the credential vault. So we said the password is uppercase automation, one, two, three, and I'll hit apply. Great. So if we think back to our original pseudocode, we've got the open program file, we've got the enter email address, we've got the enter password. Uh, the last thing we need to do is click that sign in button. So we've got yet another record capture step here. So I'm gonna drag that over. We'll go back to window again. We'll select our same application from that dropdown and I'll hit capture object. This time I'm gonna highlight over that sign in button and it should draw a little red box there. Perfect. We'll click and it's gonna record an image there as well as all of the object properties for that particular object. So this time we see it's a button. Notice here, there is not an HTML ID on that button, okay? What does that mean? It means our DOMX path is significantly longer, right? Oh, well, it's the first button inside of this first form, inside of this first div, inside of this second div, right? And that's how we would think of a DOMX path, right? Think of it almost like, a, like an instruction of how to get to this particular object coming all the way from the root of the HTML or from basically where we had the last object ID. So if, if there was an object ID on this particular div, then our path might only be that long, but... Um, just something to keep in mind. So I always geek out about that part and, and pay attention to that as I'm building these automations. For our action, if you click that drop down, notice we have different actions here, right? And that's because this time we're interacting with a button instead of an input field. 
So I'm going to select the left click for our action and hit, uh, actually, I'm not going to hit apply this time. I want to show you something. If I click off of this particular action, notice that I have a yield sign and I have a pencil. And that's telling me that, and I have it right here too, right? Just so you can see. Uh, that's telling me that I have made changes that have not applied yet. So if I click back to this and then hit apply, we'll see that goes away, right? But when I'm building these automations, one thing I'm guilty of is like, you know, I've got a, a thousand things going through my head of like, I need to do this, then this. I'll build a particular step, right? I'll customize it and then I'll switch off to something else or build the next um, action over here or drag the next command over. Just keep in mind that as you go through and as you're seeing different objects on here, make sure to check for those little pencils to make sure where you have sa uh, settings changed that haven't been saved. Anyway, I'll hit save here. I'm going to close the labs window that we had open right here, okay? Because I'm going to run my bot and I want to make sure that my bot is able to work on its own window and everything like that. I like to just close everything else when I'm doing this kind of testing. So let's hit run here and let's see what happens. So it's going to deploy that bot to our local machine. Uh, some pre-processing checks take place just to make sure that all of your dependencies are up to date. But it will deploy here in a second. So while that's waiting, um, it is important, like I said before, make sure your bot agent is set up and updated before you start trying to build anything. Otherwise, you'll get to the point where you're ready to build and you'll start to have issues. So do make sure you've got your bot agent set up first. All right, so you can see in the runtime window in the bottom, well, right, right here, right? It's going to show every single line as it's running. So line two is active, line three, line four, and then it, it's done, right? So that runtime window can help you as you're watching your bot go so you can see exactly how the execution is going. Um, but our bot was successful. So if this was your first bot, congratulations. Great job on getting that to work. Hopefully a lot of this made sense for you. Um, this page was set up in a way so that you could get that immediate feedback of like, hey, it took 2.2 seconds. My accuracy is 100%. So I feel pretty good about what I just did, right? So keep that in mind, you know, this is, this is designed so that you can get some immediate feedback. I also want to point out here that when we're solving for these different problems, and this was a really, you know, easy page, the HTML is clean, we've got object IDs on two of the three things we interacted with, um, you may need to get creative in the way that you solve these problems. The other thing I'll say is if you think back to what we talked about in the beginning, we want to think about how a human would approach these kind of problems, right? So a human is going to most likely, if it's me, right, I'm going to click into this first field. I'm going to start to type in whatever my email address is. I'll then usually hit tab to go into the next field. And then from there, I might hit tab and then enter, right? And now obviously I didn't put in the right details there, but that's how I would fill this out. So let's see if we can have the bot do that same thing. And I want to show you this not so that the bot learns to do exactly what I do, but um, there's going to be situations where sometimes, you know, interacting with an object via the capture command doesn't work the way that you want it to, or you're working with a legacy application, and sometimes the best way to navigate through some of the menus and things like that of legacy applications is to use keystroke commands. So let's look at doing that real quick. I'm going to click on the three ellipses button here for these last two commands to disable them. So what that means is they're still going to be a part of my um, bot. They're just not going to execute, right? So if I ever need to turn them back on, I can do that. But having those there is not going to make my bot slower or anything like that. Now, what I just mentioned is we're going to do some keystrokes. So I'm going to type in here, keystroke. There we go. And we'll see that there is a command that allows me to simulate keystrokes. I want to drag that right after our enter the email address. Right now, let's think about the state of that target application at, at this point, right? Our bot has opened the application to start. Our bot has gone through and uh, entered the email address into that first field. Now we want our bot to simulate keystrokes. So if I select a window here, I'm going to select Automation Anywhere Labs, Google Chrome. 
Notice that when you're setting the properties for any of these commands, they follow kind of a same similar pattern. So the cool thing is, is once you're pretty comfortable with using a couple of them, you'll start to see that pattern and you get pretty comfortable using the others. I'm going to click this little insert keystroke um, keyboard here. And the first thing I wanted to do is hit tab, right? If we go back to this, oh man, shoot, sorry about that. I'm going to open this one in a new tab. Apologies. Um, our command would have been at the point where we were at automationanywhere.com, right? So once our, let's go back. I didn't save those commands. So I'm going to disable this one, disable this one, and oops, I'm going to go for keystrokes. This is the, the fun part about doing some of this stuff live. You don't always uh, click the right thing the first time. All right, so we're at the simulate keystrokes. This is where we were. What I was trying to explain there is at the point that this particular, our uh, record capture, I'm going to switch back to dual here, our record capture command has executed. This is what our page is going to look like, right? Our username will be in there, or our, our email address, I'm sorry. And the cursor focus will still be at the end of this email address field. So when we think about the keystrokes that we want to enter the password and then also get us to that sign in, we're first going to have to hit tab, which will get our focus down to the password field. We'll type in the password. I'm not typing it for real, obviously. And then we'll hit tab one more time. And at that point, the focus is on this sign in button. So we could actually press enter, right? Let me try this on my keyboard. Pressing enter actually hits the submit. So let's go back here and try and simulate that same thing. So if I go back to my simulate keystrokes, I'm going to select my window as the Automation Anywhere Labs. I'm going to insert keystroke here. And so this gives me um, like a, a cheat sheet of different fields that wouldn't be necessarily obvious to enter. So I'm going to hit the tab button. And then I'm going to actually type in my password, right? Because that first tab is going to get me into the password field. I'm going to type in automation123. I'll hit tab one more time. That will set the focus down to that sign in button. And then I'm going to hit enter. And that should submit the form. So let's hit apply here. We'll hit save. I'm going to close this other tab we had open that we just used for that example purpose. I'm going to hit run one more time. So we should see that this will still execute fine. Everything should still work. <clears throat> It'll go a little bit faster as well, right? Because the keystrokes really just fire off pretty instantly. And so we want to see A, if that works, and B, what impact does that have on our speed and accuracy? So it's downloading dependencies, probably because I just inserted the keystroke command for the first time. I wasn't using that previously. And now the bot is executing. So let's cross our fingers. Notice it says line one of five, but uh, our last, I think, two commands are commented out. So it's really only three lines that will truly execute. Okay, so now our time was cut down to a single second, right? I don't know if you blinked, but it went really fast. So our time was cut down to a single second, which meant that as soon as we filled in that um, user uh, email address, it immediately hit tab, typed in our password, tab, and then enter, and it submitted that form for us. Now, I wanted to show that for two reasons. One, it's helpful as you're problem solving, right? There's going to be applications where sometimes the recorder doesn't work the way that you want it to, or you can't do the exact same thing, or, you know, it's this weird Java app that was built into a, a web page, and it's like really weird to work with. Definitely look at keystrokes as a possible option. The second reason I wanted to show this is notice that it went really, really fast, right? One second for all of that. When you're creating these automations, make sure to consider the fact that I don't want my bot to go faster than the application that it's automating can keep up with, right? This was a really simple app. It page loads really fast. You know, we don't have much issue there. But if it was a legacy app or if it was like uh, a page that's loading a bunch of stuff and sometimes it takes a little bit longer because there's a full page worth of content that's loading up, Keep that in mind, right? I don't necessarily want to just fire off a bunch of keystrokes, which the page may not be ready for. And now my bot is like totally out of pace with the application. 
So there might be certain things that you like wait for and wait till I see this one particular object show up on the page. Then I know the page is loaded. And if I need to fire off some keystrokes, I can do that. Obviously, if we saw back here on my keystroke command, let's go back here to the properties of that. Uh, I do have the ability to set my delay, right? So I could make the keystrokes have a little bit longer delay in between, uh, in between presses. I also could make that shorter if I really wanted to, but um, that would be another thing you could play with. I also could have broken that up into like multiple commands. So I could have done like three separate keystroke commands if I wanted to add a weight or a delay in between each of them. Um, that would have been something else I could have done to kind of play with my timing a little bit. So those are just some different options for um, building your bot, problem solving with your bot, also testing around, right? It's, it's, for me, it's fun to test around with different ways that I can solve the same problem um, to do so efficiently and to you know, still have the bot work and still automate, but maybe do it in a slightly different way. Uh, all right, so let's switch back to our PowerPoint here. We'll go through just a brief recap. And then we'll be good. How are we doing on time? Yep, I went way long again. So um, I promise that we will do an extended Q&A next week uh, to make up for this. But yeah, I did go way long on this one. So uh, just as a brief recap on our layout, we talked about actions and packages that allow for command selection. Um, we said that you know one of the really cool things about A2019 is that it is modular like that. And that as packages are updated or as new packages become available, uh, that you'll be able to basically add those to your tool set and then you can start to use those as you're building your automations. And as Bot Store gets integrated with A2019, I think that's going to really explode the available packages and it's going to make for some really cool automations. Uh, for our layout, we had Flow View, Flow View, which was our very graphical flow chart. We also had List View, which was really just listing out the commands in, in very specific order. And then we had dual, which was kind of a split where we saw the commands listed out as well as our very graphical view. I personally like the dual view just because it helps me with my, you know, crazy wanting to see everything graphed out. But it's also helpful for me as I'm debugging and trying to understand the order of things to have that list view available. For gotchas, um, you know, just make sure that each command has been saved or applied before those changes are actually committed. So I'm guilty of that, like I mentioned, where sometimes I'll customize a command and then move on to the next thing uh, without hitting that apply button. So make sure that you're looking out for that and just look for that little pencil icon and or the yield icon, which will show you if you've missed something. Also, we wanna make sure our bot isn't going faster than the app it's supposed to be automating. And so with the recorder command, it does have like a, I think it's a 15 second where it's gonna look for that particular object to exist. So even if the page loads very slowly, it will you know, have some buffer there to wait for that particular object. But if you're doing something like keystrokes where it's, it doesn't know to wait for something, um, you know, just make sure that you're not going faster than the application that you're trying to automate can keep up with. So as a brief recap, um, give us that feedback. Thank you so much for the comments you guys have left so far, the messages to the social team. Um, it's, it's awesome to see that this, this content is connecting with people. So for sure, let us know what you like, what you don't like. Uh, if there's other content you specifically want to see, I know that IQ Bot's going to be featured here uh, in not too long, as well as Bot Insight. So those are going to be some cool topics to look out for. If there's other stuff you specifically want to see, if you like the live bot vi um, build, let us know. We can do more of this kind of stuff. Next week, we'll be back with Bot Store Accelerated Bot Building and Development Opportunity. So I'll be talking about what you can what you can actually get from Bot Store and how you can use it to accelerate your build times, as well as the development opportunity for vendors and even individuals to submit bots to Bot Store, which is a really cool opportunity. We'll also do an extended Q and A next week. I know I, I put that in here because I knew that this one might go long. Um, we'll do an extended Q and A next week to answer questions about bot building. Uh, about bot store or anything else you guys want to talk about so i will make sure to put a focus on the q a next week have your questions ready we'll be sure to address them okay thanks everyone for hanging out sorry this one went a little bit long again but appreciate your patience if you found this helpful share it let us know if you need to go back and see some stuff again definitely rewind it and build along with me okay thanks so much for hanging out we'll see you next week